and um, can go ahead and we'll call this meeting to order for the joint uh, meeting for the rules and open government committee and committee of the whole. If we can get a roll call, please. Arenas? Here. Cohen? Here. Davis? Perales? Here. Jones? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And our uh, vice mayor is out for today, so I will be chairing the meeting. Um, and first we will go to our first item, which is the review of the final agenda for uh, November 23rd, which actually is canceled. And so we don't have to take any vote on that, correct? We move, move past that? Right, we just moved to the 30th. Thank you. So we'll now go to uh, the review for November 30th. I see that's up on the screen. We're at page four. We are we are recommending an 11 a.m. start time. So um, that needs to be part of the motion. Okay. Also, I think uh, we have the agenda wrong. It says closed session is starting at 9.30. We actually are recommending closed session start at nine so that council um, can get to open session at time. Okay. So we'll make, uh, we'll all ask for the make of the motion to, to uh, include both of those changes. Um, so we have page four and five. And then six. And seven. And eight. And nine. And then 10. And 11. Oh, am I ahead of you? Yeah, I, I accidentally clicked, I think, a page back. Got it. OK, so this is 10. All right, and 11. All right, I was muting because I had a very loud bird. Twelve. And 13. And 14. And 15. 16 and 17. Oh, you do have a loud bird. <laughs> <laughs> it's very loud. And I think, is that it? 17? Yes, that's yeah, it. 17 is it. We, I also, we were talking in this last hour after this agenda already published about adding um, a public hearing for redistricting in the evening on the 30th. Because we don't have a rules next week, I'd like the maker of the motion to add that. We can always drop it if we can't get everybody coordinated for that evening, but I can't add it next week. So I'd like to try to add it today. And that's a hearing for what again? Sorry? For redistricting. We have for to redistricting. Hold one. Yeah, we have to hold by law one in the evening. And because we canceled the January 4th meeting, we need to find an extra day. Um, so uh, we're looking at December 3rd for council discussion, um, but November 30th for uh, presentation and public comment only. But we may change that. I just need to be able to add it since you guys don't have a rules next week. Okay. So, so I'll ask, go ahead. I'll, I'll, there's no ad sheet, I don't think, is there? No, there isn't. Okay, I'll move approval of this uh, agenda for November 30th with the addition that the clerk requested. And there were two other additions uh, or changes, a 9 a.m. start time for closed session and uh, publicly putting into the motion the 11 a.m. start time for open session. Got it, yes, thank you. I didn't hear that, I was on a little bit late. So we have a motion. Second. Okay. Okay. Second, thank you. Um, and I will go to members of the public. And first up, we have Blair Beekman. Hi. 
Um, and uh, just, oh, sorry, Blair, just before you start, we'll, we'll get your timer back. Um, this is just for the uh, November 30th uh, agenda. Go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess first uh, to note that uh, the November 30th agenda is not currently available on the website. So I just had to kind of, uh, you know, sit here and watch uh, it scroll over on the screen and you guys went kind of slow. Thank you for that. Uh, I was able to kind of view some of the items uh, and I offered some sort of help. So thanks. I uh, hope you can work on the issue. And in the future, I guess, if you're aware that this issue is happening, uh, to definitely know how to scroll slow uh, for these sorts of uh, items at this sort of time. Uh, you had a few items on uh, a Coyote Valley, actually. Uh, more issues on that. I heard a new way to say Coyote Valley, Cote Valley, something like that, uh, today. Uh, you know, in, in the news reports on the radio that, uh, and in the work that you've done last night, uh, you know, congratulations. It was just, uh, boy, it's just our community effort last night. And uh, thank you for that. Um, I, like what I said uh, last night, I'm interested in the ideas of, uh, you know, there, there will be a future of uh, surveillance and technology for the area. And, and it could be a good time uh, to consider, you know, the open public policies and accountability practices uh, that's possible that we can work towards with that. Um, you had an item on, uh, I think it was uh, the future of a, of a small homes area near the police station. Uh, good luck with that item. Good luck how all of the community can talk about the future of small homes in local neighborhoods and and to go learn how to have those sort of conversations in our future thank you thank you blair and um before our last public speaker speaks so just if anybody is joining us by phone you can use uh, star nine to raise your hand or if you're uh joining us by zoom here uh, use the raise hand function to speak our last speaker uh, on the november 30th agenda is paul soto uh, thank you, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I'd like to echo what uh, what Blair was stating. Um, I was I was looking for them, and they're they're not there. You guys were cool about it for like a couple of weeks, and then now it's you know kind of starting to slow up. And so I'd appreciate it if you could put that there because I'm I'm on every single one of these documents. There isn't a document that you produce that I don't read. Ever, I read every single one of them, and. So I would appreciate that as a citizen. Um, secondly, th th these 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 consent calendar items. The, in Cupertino, uh, Mayor Mayor Paul, um, when they have when they call for consent items, they ask the audience, "Hey, you guys want something pulled for consent for discussion? We're we're not afforded that." And so you're saying democracy. You say words. It's a nice word. It's pretty. D a e m o. You know C r a s y. It's a real pretty nice looking word. But if there isn't substance behind that, and that that when I'm looking at democracy, if I'm not reflected back in it, then it it, it doesn't exist. Democracy is the is the is the respect of the individual. The Bill of Rights. That was written for the individual. This is the Constitution. The Constitution was written for the individual, not a group of people, not big, large groups, not a big old nonprofit, the individual, because the individual does not lose his autonomy, nor his, 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 his exercise and powers of democracy to assert them because someone else in power decided that that's not the case and we're going to apply it this way that's not happening and so i just appreciate uh some more democracy rather than a kind of totalitarian kind of uh type of government thank you okay thank you uh and we do have one more speaker uh carl um i believe bomb heckle yeah, yes. Um, so we can speak on any point in the agenda right now? No. Right now we're on the uh, first item, which is the review of our November 30th oh, okay. draft right. agenda. I'm, I'm going to lower my hand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's our last public speaker. And I will ask.
um our clerk tony um i actually just tried the to to access the agenda through um the for the november 30th agenda which is on our a link to our rules agenda and it actually is not popping up so i understand um you stated that it may have been published uh just afternoon but when you actually click on the agenda it it, it doesn't populate so there might be an issue there Okay, I just tested it on my computer and it worked, but I may be accessing it different than you guys. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else is having trouble, but I, I did try it and it is, it's not coming yeah. up for me. So, um, so yeah, if we could take a look at that and, and on the back end and see if we can get that up, I, I appreciate the, those comments. Obviously we want to be able to, to, to have that available to view. Um, and I do recognize that's why we've tried to go slower. We've gotten that feedback. Um, if, if the speed is still too fast, um, I'm happy as well to, to slow that down and ask our, our, uh, vice mayor, uh, in the future to, to, you know, sort of remain, uh, going slow. So then that way it's legible. Okay. I'll now go to members of the committee and, uh, we have, uh, council member Clark. Yeah, I did just a quick question about, about the, um, schedule for the redistricting. You're saying we're. We're having uh, we have to have three meetings. So that means they're all going to be within that one week time frame. If this happens on the evening of no, if or no, I just we need to have we have to have one in the evening, and then the other ones can be scheduled at another time. So we were looking at the agenda for the fourteenth or the thirtieth. The thirtieth looks a little lighter than the fourteenth. Um, so we're I'm trying to see if the the consultant can be there to do a public hearing for public comment on the thirtieth in the evening. And then um, we can do December 3rd, 7th and 14th, all three of them. We can do December 3rd and 14th. There, we, have, we have other options. I'm just trying to get an evening meeting where you guys aren't gonna be there till two in the morning. It's the 7th and 14th or two. So what you're saying, what I'm just asking about is the final meeting will either be the 7th or the 14th if that hasn't been decided yet. Is that what I'm hearing? Right, well, if, you, if we have January 11th as the final final. Um, oh, January 11th. I see. So yeah. So, so okay. But we're we're trying to avoid January 4th, which is was originally on our schedule. Um, you guys might be able to. The commission's meeting tonight to do um, their final approval of a commission map to forward to you guys, um, and then you know hopefully that's a really good map and everybody's very happy with it. You know they they they're trying very hard to um, take everybody's feedback into consideration. Um, you may be done by December 14th. You may say, you know, everybody might be really happy, but you have another meeting on January 11th. I see. Okay, just was clarifying. Thank you for that. Okay. I think that's all of our uh, comments. I did have one on the, uh, the 30th um, agenda. There is an item um, which likely my, my guess is going to be um, that this should should just be discussed at the council. But um, there's an item about the uh, signage at the airport, and in my review of it, um, I, I I believe that that is an item that likely should go back to an RFP, and um, and just wanted to get the input from the city staff here as far as um, my understanding would be, uh, we keep this on the, the 30th agenda and, and I make that appeal at that point. We would concur with that approach, Chair Perales. Okay, I'll save my advocacy for then. All right, uh, we have a motion and a second. Um, we can get a roll call vote, please. Reynas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Perales? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Go back to our agenda here. Apologies. And now we have our um, going down to the public record. Do we have three hands up? First up will be Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, this is, I mean, this is just like disgusting. The, the, Gary Dillabo, Jeff Arriaga, and that that clan of, of, of freaking, yeah, that clan of people 
they don't have the ability to feel shame, to feel embarrassed, or have any compunction about asking for that money. Now, I talked to you about this many months ago, uh, Councilman Perales, and I also talked to Scott Meese. You're not going to turn downtown. You're not going to create your little army and use the cops to do it. You're not going to use the cops as your own personal army in order to protect your investment. That's not going to happen. And then using money from COVID, where the Latinos are the ones that had the most deaths, that had the most infections, and got that way protecting people like Ariaga, protecting people like Adilabo, protecting people like a Richie. This is, I mean, do you, does this city really need for me to tell you how immoral, how unethical, and actually just how inhumane, how completely apathetic and completely thoughtless? They call them sinvergüenzas. That Spanish word I know. And that means shameless. You, you don't have the capacity to feel shame. And you're over here with your hand out begging for money. Gary Dillabo's is as bad as a homeboy in front of a 7-Eleven asking for a quarter, but he's got 10 bucks in his pocket. What are you doing coming here asking my city for money and then calling himself an institutional landlord? Man, you ain't nothing, dude. This is Sano, homie. You're a guest in this house. That's all I got to say. All right, our next speaker will be Brian. Hi, how you doing? Um, I just wanted to ask a question real quick. What does note and file mean? Because I'm under the impression that it means it just gets... <laughs> do I... I'll take a verbal answer if somebody can't. Do people actually read the emails and the letters we send? I, I'm not sure about that. So anyways, I, that's all I want to ask. I do appreciate the work you all do. I, I do. It's hard and it, it, you're trying really hard. I just, we want to help too. And I'm just trying, I'm having a hard time communicating those needs or communicating what I think would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, take the privilege of answering that after our public speakers are done. Uh, last will be Blair Beekman. All right, thank you. Um, I guess, you know, to comment on uh, what Paul was saying, I hope that, uh, you know, if they're, if they're asking for a new round of, of police foot patrol uh, coming, what, what, is, what is the status of uh, criminal issues in the downtown area? How is that process going? Is it, is it a more mellow situation? And do we ask about, uh, you know, the ideas of police and community harmony and, and work on those type of issues, make those issues clear? And how we're working on and, and deciding uh, the issues of their letter. Uh, there was a few letters about um, rezoning issues. Uh, if applicable, I'm not sure if it is. Uh, I invite all sides of that issue to look into the ideas of mixed income. And that can be an interesting way to uh, what can be acceptable, uh, you know, to, to accept different levels of income within a certain uh, urban village area. And it can actually it can be a wide range. It can be more accepting of a wide range. Uh, hope people can look at that. Um, there was a really interesting letter from the SAP that spoke about climate change issues and sea level rise issues that uh, we need to be wary of and that they're fully behind good plans, uh, what we can do here in San Jose by 2030. Uh, thank you for that plan. And then my letter was about uh, the future of uh, the city charter uh, well, the public agenda and the use of um, um, the city manager's report, closed session agenda and orders of the day. And I've been trying to learn how to mention it and also the, the consent calendar itself. How can this process just learn that, uh, you know, the, the person in charge of the meeting offers the concept that these items can be open to public comment? And that's all I'd like to work on. And I think we should work on that issue. Me, Paul, and Tessa are all working on ways to do that. I hope we can continue this issue uh, in the future. Hey, thank you. Uh, that concludes our public comment. And just, uh, Brian, to your, your question, um, the note and file is, uh, is just the terminology that we utilize uh, in regards to denoting how we are noting uh, these letters that come in and then filing them for the public record. And um, 
and accepting that. And so we at the Rules Committee do that, as you know, on a weekly basis. Uh, we get sometimes a lot of letters, sometimes not many, um, but it's uh, this Rules Committee that, that will review those. Uh, we, we look over those, read over those, and, uh, and then here uh, make the formal um, acceptance and filing of them. With that, I'll go back to members of the uh, committee. We have Councilmember Adenas. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to comment on this um, public records appeal. Um, this PRA, um, for technical reasons... Um, that is actually later in the agenda, I believe. I'm sorry, am I on the wrong... No worries. Yeah, that one is coming up actually after right. our, uh, uh, that's item I, I believe is what the one you're talking about, right? The public uh, records appeal from Catherine Wh Wheeland? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm on the no wrong worries. item. No worries. That'll come up after our, uh, our, Thank you. our item uh, two. Okay. All right. So if we can get a motion to note and file. So moved. Second. And Motion a second. If we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Owen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Oh, no, Jones. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. And I'll take us down to item uh, G1, our consent calendar. And Move approval. Oh. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we'll go to members of the public. We have uh, one hand up, Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, is this a time to talk about the uh, labor negotiation issues and the PLA issues? No, that'll come up next. Okay, thank you for that. I may have one com quick comment on consent then about uh, you're using a, you have new ideas of a e-waste stratathon, and uh, I guess these are trash ideas and I just wanted to say hi to that sort of work and efforts and uh, thank you for that. And I think that's, uh, that should be about all. Yeah, it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Blair. Okay. We'll come back, uh, members of the committee. Councilor Ordenas, your hand is up still. Was that from before? Okay, so if we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Crawlis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us to item G2. And this is the project labor agreement amendments. Um, and we have, um, I know we have, uh, I believe Councilmember Esparza I saw here, and we also have an early consideration form from staff. Um, and I'm happy to uh, uh, allow staff to respond first on this, and then I'll, I'll see if my council colleagues want to speak or if they want to go over to members of the public first. Lee? Sure, thank you, Chair. Uh, staff does have an early consideration form in, um, and we had marked that a yellow. Um, based off of the level of work around policy and also indicated that um, if this policy did move forward at whatsoever time, implementing it would require um, resources. So we recommend a yellow light and then it'd be referred into the budget process. Um, and Matt Kano is here for any questions on uh, specifics around the program. Thank you, Chair. All right, you're welcome. And I apologize, I'm devouring my lunch. Um, so uh, I will ask my colleagues, the, the co-signers on the memo, to see if you'd like to speak on this or if you'd like to go to the public first. I think we should go to the public first. Agreed. So uh, we'll go over to members of the public. And first hand up is David Beanie. And just as a reminder, we're talking about item G2, uh, the Project Labor Agreement Amendments. Uh, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, the San Jose Citywide Project Labor Agreement was adopted in large part for the numerous recognized benefits that PLAs provide to construction users. These benefits include, among others, increased prevention of wage and hour violations, increased timeliness and reliability of construction, promotion of local apprenticeships, and providing well-paying family supporting careers for local residents. These things continue to be true. 
as we see with some of the recent city projects that were not subject to the PLA, that these non-PLA projects have rampant wage theft, apprenticeship violations, and production delays. The improvements recommended in this memo by council members Cohen and Esparza will ensure workers on the city's mid-sized projects are protected from wage theft and exploitation and have the opportunity to advance up the career ladder with apprenticeships. It will increase community benefits uh, by removing the list of exclusions, currently restricting a large number of projects from being covered. It will also promote the highest standards of construction career training by allowing only high road construction education programs to participate. Placing more projects within the scope of the PLA will decrease the misuse of public funds on public construction and provide high quality construction that's on time and on budget. Uh, the hard work on implementing the PLA has already been done. The processes are in place and the policy has been proven. Projects are moving forward under the PLA. The addition of more projects will have significant impact for the community and for local workers, but as shown by the $10 billion capital improvement program of Santa Clara County that is covered by a project labor agreement, no additional staff is needed. Uh, on behalf of the 35,000 workers of the Santa Clara and San Benito counties Building and Construction Trades Council, I urge you to adopt these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. That was a really nice report to hear. It really uh, helped myself <laughs> understand things. Thank you. Um, I remember, you know, in the past several years here in San Jose, uh, you know, there was a lot of work uh, to get uh, PLA agreements down to uh, this sort of level. And uh, thank you, I guess, you know, is, is, in, is in need for, for all the previous good work you've done on this item uh, to make this item today easier to understand and work with, I think. Um, thank you. Um, it's my hope that uh, from this time, I just wanted to offer a simple reminder of the good work and planning that's going on about the future of uh, ELI, VLI, and mixed income housing ideas. Uh, the work at the regional level and with the MTC, you know, they have plans for, you know, 2025 to 2029. I think we can start talking and working with those ideas now and uh, really consider them and really I, I think if we are, I, we can start things sooner and to uh, prepare, you know, the trade unions and construction unions uh, about these good things that are, you know, just on the horizon. Uh, it can help in the decision making and for better work practices and work worker safety issues. And uh, I, I think, I think mixed income ideas can actually bring a better, uh, more hopeful idea of how to work these ideas. Um, and uh, you know our, our how to work with our uh, the future of uh, you know construction and such. And I, I think there can be a good uh, mix of ideas, <laughs> basically. Uh, and and that, that was very nicely explained in the previous report. So thanks for all your help with this item. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Blair. And just a reminder: if you're calling in, you can use star nine to raise your hand or the raise hand function on. Zoom and uh, for everybody's uh, info, we have 10 hands that are raised right now. Um, and next up will be Andres Quintero. Hi, uh, member of the Rules Committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Andres Quintero, I'm with the Alarm Rock School Board, and I'm calling to support this expansion of the project labor agreements. I believe that now I know for a fact that this uh, this would go ahead and expand opportunities to uh, better wages for to ensure that everybody's getting the proper remuneration that they, de they rightfully deserve. Uh, more importantly, it ensures that we're getting good, uh, good work. The craftsmanship is going to be there and that uh, the projects that are being done are going to be on time and on budget and the, the work's going to be good. And so that's very important as well. In addition, I'm very supportive of this because of the fact that we, we would go ahead and expand opportunities for historically underrepresented communities to have access through the apprenticeships provision in this policy. For that reason, I'm calling to request that you support this and move it forward and ultimately approve this at City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Erica Valentine. Uh, 
Hi, council members. This is Erica from UA Local 393. I'm just calling um, regarding this PLA. Um, the threshold seems to be that it was arbitrary with no purpose, but to limit the benefits afforded to the community by the agreement. So I urge you to please consider the members of Local 393. We have over 2,000 members in this county that we would like to um, consider for this agreement and to have you reconsider this arbitrary threshold. All right, thank you. Next up is Joseph Lopez. How are you guys doing today? Uh, my name is Joseph Lopez. I'm with the Carpenters Union, Local 405, and um, just not to be dead horse, but uh, we are also in support of the changes made to the PLA. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a San Jose native myself, and um, I'm actually happy that we are in talks with the, you know, having a San Jose PLA uh, citywide, and um, I am in support. We are in support of decreasing the threshold and removing the link to the CPI. Um, it just creates more um, job opportunities for um, people in our communities, especially the communities that are in poverty, uh, the youth to get into an apprenticeship program, uh, start a career, work in their backyard, make a good wage to live in the city of San Jose. I think the biggest fear is that, you know, we have to move out or we have to uh, do something else. Um, and with the apprenticeship being available, uh, being free for in, in, in a, a state certified program, it gives future to our future, the youth of our future. And um, I just, um, we're, in, we're in support. Uh, Local 405 has 4,200 members and they all agree. Um, and yeah, definitely that's, that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next up is Luis Auerhahn. Thank you, good afternoon. Luis Auerhahn with Working Partnerships USA. Uh, I want to thank the council members for introducing and considering this item. Uh, I found it and directed the trade orientation program which helps our disadvantaged and underrepresented community members in San Jose to enter construction careers. And TOP is a partnership uh, with Work to Future, so with the city of San Jose and with the Building Trades Apprenticeships. On a volunteer basis, we play the role of the community workforce coordinator for the targeted hiring in the San Jose PLA. Uh, to date, this, this is a pretty recent, only seven projects so far under the PLA are far along enough for targeted hiring. But on just those seven projects, 31 underrepresented community members have been placed through the PLA targeted hiring and gotten their start at, in an entry level and a skilled trade apprenticeship. Expanding the PLA as you're considering to more projects will help expand those opportunities to many more people. And why does that matter? Because this isn't just about getting a job, this is about getting an on-ramp to a career. State registered apprenticeship is an amazing opportunity to earn while you learn, to get regular pay, uh, pay increases all while learning a skill and getting a post-secondary education. But first you have to put a foot in the door and that means getting an employer, getting your first job. And that's what project labor agreements and what the targeted hiring can do. Uh, so I really, this has been great so far, but its impact is limited because of the threshold. So I would really encourage you to expand it. Finally, this absolutely fits into the city roadmap. The first enterprise priority on the roadmap is community and economic recovery, which includes reemployment and workforce development. Construction is one of our designated priority industries for our region and should be included in that enterprise priority. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Carl Baumheckel. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in favor of amending the citywide PLA, uh, just as was uh, proposed by uh, members Esparza and Cohen. Uh, and I understand uh, I, we've already gone over the, the pluses from it, but there's pushback from the city staff. Uh, and I have some points to hit. So first of all, the PLA has not caused any additional workload on the projects to which has been applied. Any work on compliance associated with the PLA project is overlapped by the city's existing compliance responsibility, which must be done regardless of a PLA. The PLA adds only one meeting to a construction project, which is coordinated by the Building Trades Council and the contractors, not city staff. The County of Santa Clara did not hire even one full-time staff to administer the PLA because there was no need to do so. Thank you for listening to me and uh, have a great day. 
All right, thank you. Next up is Jay Busley. Thank you. My name is Jay Bosley. I'm the council representative for the Santa Clara San Benito County Building and Construction Grades Council. Uh, as was said earlier, the council is made up of several trade unions representing some 35,000 members in the Santa Clara and San Benito counties. A large portion of these trades members live in San Jose. They support the proposed changes of the city wide PLA. When I was a younger man, the industry leaders were Dan Caputo, Bo Raish, and Leo Piazza. And they worked hand in glove with Sam Della Maggiore, who was a city council member. And this was long before PLAs were ever thought of. And they carried the industry and the community's water about getting people trained, providing them with good jobs, family supporting jobs. And these three guys have gone to meet their maker quite some time ago. These four guys have gone to meet their maker some time ago. And we're left with the PLA situation the way it is. The council supports these changes because the members support these changes. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and we do still have seven uh, hands raised. Uh, there still are some hands coming up. Uh, next up is Forrest. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Earn while you learn. I'd like to defer real quick to Luis Sarah and the comments that uh, that they made. I think uh, Luis is the authority in the region on this topic, so I just want to add to to their comments. So, members of the Rules Committee, my name is Dr. Forrest Peterson. I'm a researcher at the Center for Integrated Facilities Engineering at Stanford University. My comments are in support of Councilors Esparza and Cohen speaking specifically to allow the need to use joint apprenticeship programs. The Center for Integrated Facility Engineering has had a seven-year collaborative research study of which I'm the lead researcher. In my seven years of workforce education research developing grounded theory that includes vastly more field research than is typical, I have yet to encounter a non-union apprenticeship that is in the field, at the research center with technical advisory committee members, that's with the donor base or with alumni. Further, in my own 25 years in the construction industry at all levels from day labor to postdoctoral researcher, I've never seen a non-union apprenticeship. They're not even here today. That degree of absence is telling. The PLA is not a burden. I've been a project engineer on nearly $500 million in in-place civil construction works, and I've never had a PLA seem to be anything that was even I can recollect. So I wanna just also notice that uh, the County of Santa Clara did not allocate anyone to administer the PLA. By chance, that would have been me because I was a labor standards investigator for my year of public service to resolve my student debt after finishing the PhD. I can assure you, I was never assigned a PLA to work on, ever. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up is Paul Soto. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, labor. I thought that it was ironic when the the men that were enslaved and put in that container, and they were, they, I read about it in the paper. When I found out its location and the irony of that project being right behind the Fallon House was not lost on me. And what that told me is that there is this constant racial element discrimination in labor. The, the city, the county, the state, and the country is strung out on slave labor. It's just strung out like a heroin addict. If it starts detoxing from it, it needs to get more. So it, what it does is it strengthens immigration laws. That's how it gets more dope, strengthens immigration laws. And so with respect to labor, whatever decision that you're going to make, the only way that anything like this is going to be fair or just is if the exploitation of the human being's body for his labor stops. It just stops. Because these contracts are basically for everybody that earns under $150,000 a year. 
Más o menos. 150. These people, in five years, that's going to be low income. $150,000 a year is going to be considered low income in five years. And so I applaud your efforts. It's cool. I don't know what it's like to have a job. I haven't worked in 20 years. But I'll leave you with this. If it's a policy that Andres Quintero is going to vote on and that he's for, then I'm absolutely 100% against it. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, Ernesto Bejarano. And uh, Ernesto, you may have to accept the unmute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I was looking at it. I was on another screen here. And so I missed that. Um, good good, thank you, council members. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ernesto Bejarano. I am a resident of the East Side and a board member on the Allen Rock School Board. And I am here to support the expansion of the scope of the PLA. Uh, you know, even before the pandemic, the economic opportunity and, and job safety and security were issues, and they've historically been issues for many of our residents here in East San Jose and certainly in Alam Rock. Um, and, and those issues have only been exacerbated by the pandemic. I know they've been, they've impacted everybody. The, the pandemic has impacted everybody, but, you know, a lot of what we've seen in terms of negative impact has been multiplied in the Alan Rock School District in East San Jose. And so I think one reason that uh, Trustee Quintero and myself are here um, speaking on this item is beca because we know that access to safe, secure jobs and opportunities for the skilled workers that we have in our district, that trickles down to our students and it impacts their academic performance as well as their social emotional well-being. You know, when they have parents who are able to um, have opportunities to, to these well-paying jobs that they know that their wages will be appropriately um, you know, received and all the protections that come under a PLA, that impacts what we see at the district level in terms of the performance and well-being of our students. So for those reasons, I would um, hope that this would move forward and um, I would join Trustee Quintero in support of this memo. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next up is Dominic Torian. Yeah, thank you, uh, committee members. My name is Dominic Toriano. I'm a business representative for Sheet Metal Workers Local Union 104 in San Jose. Decreasing the PLA threshold will help by limiting the contracts the understaffed Office of Equality Assurance will have to closely monitor. The PLA has the benefit of its enforcement language, which is administered primarily by the staff of the relevant Building Trades Council affiliate. This helps foster an environment where unscrupulous contractors will either stop cheating or stop contracting with the city of San Jose. Lowering the PLA threshold would help not hurt staffing shortfalls. Finally, I'm not sure how much of the council members have heard about the city of San, San Francisco scandal regarding the former public works director taking bribes in return for construction contracts. He used informal bidding practices to accomplish this criminal scheme. This individual was the primary reason why the city of San Francisco took so long to get a PLA implemented as he led the opposition to it. This scandal caught all of the city of San Francisco elected officials off guard and they quickly realized why their public works director was opposed to project labor agreements. To their credit, they subsequently passed a PLA which graduates to a $1 million threshold and has no exclusion for CPI. Thank you for your consideration, and I urge you to support the memo from Council Members Cohen and Esparza. Thank you. Next up is Krista De La Torre. Here on behalf of the South Bay Labor Council to speak on the Esparza Cohen memo. Um, first, I want to address the threshold outlined in the memo. Currently, the threshold and the exclusions are, and or, sorry, were arbitrary and serve no purpose but to limit, limit the benefits afforded to the community by the agreement. 
Um, secondly, I want to note that our city's PLA hasn't created any additional workloads on the many projects where it has been applied. Uh, the PLA adds only one meeting to a construction project, which is coordinated by the Building Trades Council and the contractors, notably not the city staff. Uh, in the past, County of Santa Clara did not hire even one full-time staff to administer their PLA because there was no need to do so. Any work on compliance associated with the PLA project is overlapped by the city's existing compliance responsibility, which must be done regardless of a PLA. Um, if we amend the PLA as suggested, San Jose will help countless underrepresented working community members gain access to local careers that will truly help to support their families. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, we have two speakers left. Next up is Edmundo uh, Escarcega. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm Edmundo Escarcega with the Plumbers and Steam Fitters 393, and I'm a lifelong resident of San Jose. I support the amendment by council members Council members Cohen and Esparza. The current $3 million threshold is not inclusive enough to provide the benefits of the PLA to mid sized city public works projects. The current agreement is only covering about a dozen projects so far. Uh, we need more projects covered under the PLA. The proposed amendment to expand the scope of the PLA to $1 million is in line with PLA thresholds of many other jurisdictions and still higher than others. It's important that the benefits of the PLA are expanded to ensure local hiring, more apprentices get proper proper training and career opportunities. Uh, I urge the council to adopt the recommendations by council members Cohen and Esparza. Thank you. Thank you. And our last public speaker will be uh, Jose Espinosa. Hello, my name is Jose Espinosa. I'm the visitor for the painters. Uh, I represent over uh, 1,200 members and I'm in favor of the uh, advanced test in the private, uh, uh, pro uh, not in the project labor agreements, but uh, uh, the the government uh, wages, uh, prevailing wages, and it's really hard. As we have a PLA that we can help our wage, especially right now that everything is going up. So I mean favor of the attendant and thank you so much for your time. Okay, that'll conclude our public comment. We'll come back to the committee. And uh, first up will be Councilman Resparso. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of background first off on uh, why, why this was so important to me personally. <clears throat> And that is when I was the director of the All the Way Home campaign to end veteran homelessness, um, we uh, decided to work with currently homeless veterans and get them into top. That was the trades orientation program that Louise Auerhan talked about. And so we, we did, we filled the top class with veterans. Um, we often bust them in from the homeless shelter at the VA in Palo Alto. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and in addition to filling that class, we were able to get uh, other veterans directly into apprenticeship programs. So it was a really personal experience for me to see um, that experience change the lives of veterans. Um, some were able to, uh, to get their first car, get their own apartment, um, build a career for themselves um, out of this experience. It was also eye-opening for me to, as I worked with a lot of the veterans in the All the Way Home Campaign program, who uh, they were pretty much from their 20s to their 40s. And as I talked to a lot of the older folks, um, they shared with me that they had construction experience. Um, and, and as we talk throughout the time that they were in the top program, they realized that they didn't really get proper training. They, they, cause everybody starts at the bottom, right? At the union, everybody starts at the same place and then you get trained. Um, you kind of go to school the whole time you're in a union. Um, and, and so they got trained and they realized, hey, I didn't really get trained how to do that. Oh, I never learned how to do that. I never learned that. And, um, and so as they got into, um, the top program and into apprenticeships afterwards, um, they got the proper training, they got paid 
to learn. And we were able to provide a path for homeless veterans to become self-sustaining. <clears throat> It showed me how life-changing these programs can be. It showed me the quality of the training and the work um, of the joint apprenticeship programs. And, um, and it was why I supported uh, building this work into our COVID recovery efforts. And we had an extensive discussion um, during the roadmap exercise about that because to me, it's how we build back better. How we build back better isn't by providing somebody a dead end job, it's how we provide a path to a career path to someone, how we provide a livable wage. And so as we work to build back to a better normal in the aftermath of COVID, the safety and well-being of our workers who are literally building our city is a critical foundation of this work. Project labor agreements provide agencies with labor and labor with a framework for construction projects that reduce labor conflicts, shortages of skilled workers, help prevent wage theft or catch it early, ensure projects are delivered on time, on budget, and under, sa under safety protocols. And while our current PLA program has provided has promoted safety, efficiency, and career pathways in the projects that it has covered, it has only covered about a dozen projects in two and a half years. This is because the very high $3 million threshold and a large number of exemptions provided under the addendum C of the agreement leave the vast majority of our city projects uncovered by the PLA. So we are proposing amendments to expand the PLA to cover projects of a million dollars or more and remove the exemptions from addendum C, allowing projects such as street resurfacing and building retrofits that are currently excluded. Among jurisdictions in California with PLAs, our current threshold of $3 million is extremely high. The $1 million threshold is in line with Sacramento, San Leandro, Alameda County, Contra Costa County, and is still, is still higher than the thresholds of many cities with PLAs, including Long Beach and Los Angeles. We also propose eliminating the annual CPI adjustment to the threshold, which causes a lot of confusion and uncertainty amongst bidders as to whether a given project is covered. <clears throat> and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we propose requiring joint apprenticeship programs approved by the California Division of Apprenticeship Standards to ensure that all apprentices are receiving high quality training and have the opportunity to advance and avoid abuses of the apprentice uh, classification. And unfortunately, we have recently seen examples and heard reports of a number of recent city projects not covered by PLAs, which have been subject to wage theft, apprenticeship violations, and production delays. Our proposal dovetails with two of the existing top items on the prioritized backlog of the city roadmap, including wage theft prevention, which is number two, and the local hiring business apprenticeship utilization program, which is number four. Staff assured council during our roadmap exercise that work on these top priorities would continue this year. As we continue our economic recovery from the devastation brought forward by the pandemic, we owe it to our workers and our taxpayers to ensure that workers on our city projects are being protected. This is critical as we continue to build back better and I urge the rules committee to support moving this important work forward to the full council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up will be Council Member Cohen. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to all the members of the public who spoke on this and came out and explained their perspectives as to why this is important for our city and for people who work in our city. Uh, thank Council Member Sparza for partnering on this, but also you gave a great, she gave a great summary of why this is important. Um, I, I don't want to repeat any of that, but I do have some questions for staff about some of these things because there's a um, few paragraphs on the early consideration form that I want to get some clarification about. Um, as we, you know, many talked about, as Councilmember Esparza mentioned, um, we've had projects that have, had, that have been 
um, had issues of wage theft or violations and delays, those were projects that were not covered by a PLA. Um, I, I'm, one of the things that was mentioned here was that in order to um, handle this change, it would require additional staffing in the uh, public works department. So I guess I have a question. I think Matt is on the call, uh, is on the meeting, so he can maybe address this. As I understand it, I mean, we're, we're bidding projects right now as a city, and we have we may be understaffed for doing that. I, I don't doubt that we are. Um, what is it about a project making sure that there are PLA requirements in the uh, bid documents and in the in the process for bidding for contracts that would make the the that would require that the city has more staff to do it to do to go out and sign those contracts with uh, with um, Contractors that do the work. I can. I. Oh, sorry. You ready for my answer, Council yeah. Member? Sorry, I, didn't, I thought it was interrupting. No, no, Thank you, um, Matt Kana, Director of Public Works. Thank you for the question. Um, part of, it's 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 multifaceted, um, and part of it um, is what you addressed. Um, I, with with respect to other organizations and other cities and other agencies out there, um, as we know, um, San Jose is thinly staffed. Um, we have a a tremendous workload. And we have a lot of high priority projects and um, more coming all the time. Um, and so when we have um, things like, let's, let's just say the PLA was expanded to most of our, if, if, this, if this passed, it would be expanded to most of our capital projects. Um, it would be, um, and something that, um, it, it would be ext an extremely port important um, initiative that we, that, so that, it would be extremely important for us to implement it correctly. Um, yes, there is one meeting, as, as was mentioned, that needs to happen at the beginning of the project. Um, however, as the project goes on, it's really important that our project managers, every project manager in my organization, which is a lot of project managers, are fully trained and fully aware of what is a PLA, what are some um, attributes of a PLA, what are those things they should be aware of as the project goes on, um, such as when new subcontractors come on, um, they need to be make sure they're under the umbrella of the PLA as well, um, and that they need to make sure the targeted worker um, um, priorities are met as well. So really what is extremely important to me, if we have an important policy initiative like this that is pretty much on every one of my projects, is that all my project managers are fully trained on what a PLA is and the importance of it, as well as, um, and that's continuously, that we are um, regularly meeting with the Building Trades Council and the TOPS program and working partnership to check in on how the PLA is going um, so that we can um, talk about tweaks or, or amendments or, or how we work together and how we can change where, where we work together. There's um, tracking statistics on PLA projects to make sure that um, if there's any um, local business um, uh, preferences that we would want to, we don't have that now, but if we wanted to, ensure that local businesses um, are included as well. Tracking the statistics, tracking the statistics of targeted workers. Um, and, and so there's a lot, again, and part of that goes to um, back to the beginning, something you referenced and I stated at the beginning is we are a very thinly staffed organization with a very heavy workload. And for me, it would be important on a PLA not just to um, put it on the project and and forget about it, um, it'd be important for me to actively ensure that it is being um, implemented appropriately in my organization. And that's why um, I would need additional staffing to do that. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, obviously I will, I will probably always stipulate that when we're deal, talking about city departments and the work that they do that we're not staffed as high as we should be. Um, that's probably a fact of life in government and probably in many, not just in government, but in business these days as well, but I'll, I'll stipulate that. Um, it sounds to me like the you know, concern you have is about what happens after a contract is signed, after, after um, work starts in terms of monitoring and making sure that PLAs are, are followed appropriately and that we're doing all of the work that we need to do. And it, it, I think I understand that even now we have a difficulty in terms of having enough staff to monitor even all the proper labor compliance issues that may come up on projects. Is that fair to say? Yeah, um, we're, we're very understaffed in, in my Office of Quality Assurance. So and that, that's happening and we, we're seeing, 
you know, issues come up on projects that are not PLA, at least in the, so far, the projects where it's happened have, have not had PLAs. Like, um, one of the things I understand about a PLA is that um, you know, the labor partners in, in that uh, are providing resources as part of that contract and PLA in order to monitor compliance from the other end as well, which actually I think would help us in terms of being able to monitor projects and make sure that, that they are compliant to the rules that we want to have in place for our workers. So um, while it, it certainly is true that our city could improve staffing in terms of their labor compliance issues, um, PLA, the idea of the PLA is that you, by making sure you have these, um, uh, you, you sign contracts with companies that are going to follow a certain set of guidelines, um, that you end up with fewer issues of, of wage theft, of apprenticeship violations, of other workplace uh, violations in the first place by virtue of having a strong partner, and you have the partnership with labor to help monitor and make sure that um, these violations don't happen. So uh, is that... I, I think, Councilmember, to, to your point, um, the, the strong partnership, I mean, uh, I, you know, working partnerships and building trades council have been great partners um, 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 over, over the years um, since I've been public works director the past three and a half years. Um, and I would, I absolutely, we would continue that, but, but great partnership um, for me, it, it means to be proactive in that partnership. It means to really proactively work with um, the Building Trades Council, the um, and Working Partnerships and the TOPS program and, and all the other partners, uh, many of whom spoke today. Um, and to proactively work with the partners on a really important initiative requires staffing. Um, um, I, not tons of new staff. Um, and, and I, I, um, I you know, it, but it, re it, it does require staffing. Um, to ensure that we are always maintaining that extremely strong proactive relationship and that we're working on initiatives together. There's a lot, I know they're on the backlog, um, uh, but the initiative of local hire, um, local business um, participation um, and making sure that those, um, um, that our workers in San Jose and our businesses in San Jose are getting as much of our CIP money as possible to, um, increase their abilities to succeed in life, um, that, that proactive management requires, requires staffing. Um, and so I definitely um, definitely look forward to kind of continuing these conversations, but I guess that's my quick answer for that. Right. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you being here and being able available to answer my questions. Um, just to uh, uh, you know, move on and let others on the committee ask questions or, or give their input, let me just conclude for now and say, you know, our, our city has priorities in place already for local hiring, for apprentice utilization. These are the kinds of priorities that will be enhanced by uh, making sure that we have more projects covered by a PLA. Um, it's particularly important right now as we move um, forward in uh, coming out of the pandemic where we need to get give people economic opportunity that we uh, create these job opportunities and safe work environments for people and build that kind of pipeline that Councilmember Esparza talked about for long-term careers and not uh, short-term jobs. So I, I'd like to move the memo from Councilmember Esparza and myself and, um, and allow others on the committee to, to come in. Second. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other, oh, I do. Uh, Councilmember Davis, thanks. Thank you. Um, Matt, does it, what does it add to the cost of our contracts to have project labor agreements? Thank you for that, Davis. Uh, sorry, thank you for that question, Councilmember Davis. Um, we per, we've been tracking that. Um, and, and at this point, we don't think it is adding anything to the cost of the projects as, as far as the bids that we're receiving from the contractors. We presented a report to the Marin City Council a few weeks back, our annual capital improvement program report, where we track what our engineers estimates are for all of our projects. Um, um, at how, well, sorry, how close the low bids are to our engineers estimate on all of our projects. And then we have a specific section in that report on project labor agreements um, and how our engineers estimate tra is tracking according to the bids on the project labor agreements. And it's pretty much the same. Um, so we aren't seeing any increased bid prices on the 
BLA projects. Okay, I I appreciate that. Um, that that was a concern for me because I think the the concern about the project labor agreements when we first um, started talking about them was really about the cost and the amount that was set was because we were concerned about the balance, frankly, between taxpayers and what what has been promised to taxpayers and what um, and and workers. So the concern, at least for me, with the with the pavement was about what had been promised through through Measure T and getting every street paved before um, by 2029. So I appreciate that. That's a very useful piece of data. So the the concern here is really to want from the um, the early consideration form is really that there are other items on the roadmap that take precedence and that there's staff time involved. Is that my correct understanding and that might be a more of a question for Lee than for Matt. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll either one, either one. I, I, would say, I wouldn't express my my feeling out that I wouldn't. I wouldn't use. I'm not. Con, it's not a concern on my part necessarily. I, I know the way. Um, it's more um, just my. I the way when I filled out the early consideration form, just my kind of honest opinion on on the facts, which were yeah. Um, which um, I and I kind of stated my my. Kind of case to Councilmember Cohen's question about the need for right. additional resources, um, and then for, to implement, and then regarding the um, actual getting to City Council with a memorandum and renegotiating the agreement um, would uh, definitely require resources as well, um, and ultimately, um, yeah. So, and do I understand it's the same staff who would be working on the wage theft item? Well, right now, wage theft and local hire are on the um, the back the backlog, um, and so those are we did on local hire. However, I want to be we did actually advance local hire to a summary report um, in April, so we did keep working on local hire even after it was put on the backlog for a while. Um, mm -hmm. We did a report to CED committee in April, um, but and. On wage theft, um, it's hard for me to say we're not working on wage theft because we, we're always working on wage theft in the city of San Jose. But the specific right. recommendation to amend the city's policy on wage theft, with which last went for the city council on in February 2020, right before the pandemic, we are not currently working on advancing that policy change forward. Um, it seems that every day we're working on um, wage theft as an organization, though, um, in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lee, did you have anything you wanted to add to that about st the staff work? Yeah, I mean, just to clarify the, you know, we've said this before with rules, but the early consideration form is not an analysis of, the, of a policy or future policy decision. It's simply looking at the workload of staff. Um, so, you know, Matt did exactly what he should have done and, and filled it out based off of that. It's not a, a values-based um, document that we use or, you know, starting to discuss trade-offs. That's part of an ultimate recommendation that we would make to the full council. Okay. Well, I if this passed today, what I'm sorry, I don't remember the direction from the memo. When would this come back to council? And I I I guess I I'm interested to know how much work it takes to go from here to come back to council. If if we didn't move this to priority setting, because I believe the the motion was to go straight to council and not go through priority setting, and I'm concerned about that because every time we circumvent priority setting, it's pulling staff off of what we've already told them is priority to do. So, how much staff work are we talking about? Well, so I, and and this might be good clarification, um, and I would ask. Nora to correct me if I'm wrong. Typically, when staff is given something a yellow light and the rules committee has approved it, the actual recommendation from the council members has moved forward to the council so the full council can give direction. So that can happen by the end of the year. We can put that on you know, any of the last three uh, meetings that we have here um, so that we can have that conversation. And then you know, I would say you know, staff wise, um, you know, I'll let Matt respond, but if it is uh, the negotiation process with building trades and the unions is relatively straightforward. 
um, it wouldn't require an absorbent amount of time, um, at least based off of the conversation I had with Matt to bring that back to council sometime at the beginning of the year, not January, but sometime in the new year. Thanks, I said it, it, it yeah, uh, to, to just add on to what Lee said, if, if, um, if the direction was only make those four changes that were in the memo and no other changes, um, then that's different than reopening the agreement. I mean, we're two and a half years into a five-year agreement, and and I was, um, you know, that David Benin and I were um, negotiating the original agreement in 2019, and there was a lot of different things that we discussed, and and a lot of difficult discussions on items that weren't just these four items that we're being asked to look at, and so um, where. Um, we would need to get clarity from council if this moved forward was um, on what items are being looked at and what are not being looked at. And, and there may be, and to be honest, there may be items that we would, if, if this moved forward, that we want to look at um, anyways for process improvements and, and based on how things have been going. So um, we would, um, so that would be a, a you know, take staff from um, the attorney's office um, as well as um, staff from public works and and um, other de every every department is involved in the capital program, um, and so that's why there's more departments than just the attorney's office and public works that were listed on the early consideration form. Um, anything that happens here, anything that changes to the PLA does have impacts. Um, depending on what those changes are, they could be minor or major to other um, departments in the city. And Lee, when is priority setting scheduled to happen again? We don't have anything tentatively kind of scheduled um, at this point. I think we would probably be trying to do something, you know, revisit the, the current roadmap in light of kind of the, the continued response that we've been in, which we should be out of by then. But, you know, we did not, you know, the, the roadmap, as Dolan mentioned last night, when we did kind of the check-in on, on the community and economic recovery empowered by people, when, when we approved that roadmap and the backlog, we didn't believe we would still be responding like we have. So we do need to, Kind of true up some of that work and daylight yeah. some of what has happened and what hasn't happened um and then try and have that conversation with the new roadmap um which i guess is also priority setting um before the march budget message so i, I would think that would take place sometime in february okay um i'm just it, we're we're not too far away from that and i guess i don't I, I understand the the desire to get this going, and I and I don't necessarily I, I don't necessarily disagree with it. I'm just concerned about continuing to take things out of that process when we have seen from the early consideration and from what Matt has said today about the need to have budget for additional people to be able to really do this right. And I'd rather do something right than just do something to make us feel good. And so I'm, I'm really hesitant. I, I'm, I want to support staff, so I'm not going to be able to vote for this. I, I'm fine having this conversation with priority setting. There are tons of great policies that we, we discuss and we have to, I think we have to really choose, especially given what Lee just said about, you know, truing up the roadmap and the expectation about our recovery and how long it was going to be versus how long it is. Um, or has been so far. So I, I'm not going to be able to support the motion. I'd be happy to discuss this in priority setting, um, but I think we've got enough on our plate between now and the end of the year. And frankly, January and February are not too far apart. So I, I think we, I think it can wait. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Rodinez. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for calling in and for sharing your perspective on this very uh, important uh, topic. I was around when we first discussed this or last discussed this in 2019, um, and I was really disappointed back then not to have had a, uh, a million uh, dollar threshold for our projects. Um, and look forward to the opportunity to actually have that conversation once again. And so it's, it seems like there is an opportunity to do that now. And, um, and, and, uh, and I think we should take advantage of it um, to, to think that um, 
worker rights should be prioritized in the same way as any of the other um, items that we have listed on the roadmap um, doesn't seem uh, right to me. Um, I think, I mean, this was already, has already been prioritized, um, but it's been unfairly um, uh, uh, prioritized, I, I would say. Um, and I guess I think back about um, some of the reasons that people shared back in 2019 or even before 2019 about why PLAs wouldn't work and how um, work would be more expensive. Um, and the truth is that building in San Jose and in the Bay Area is expensive. It will continue to be expensive. I don't foresee it changing, um, especially with this shortage of workers. And so I think at this point, we have to look at what is it that we, how do we want to um, have workers fare out in the workforce? And what kind of uh, protections will we, and opportunities will we lay out for, for people? And so the, for me, this is what this provides is an opportunity to encourage local workers um, and their employment. And uh, when I think about the resiliency um, core and uh, what they're offering our youth um, in terms of jobs, uh, it's uh, cleaning up creeks and, and streets. Um, some of it is tutoring, but most of it is, uh, the, for, the, for the most part, it's cleaning up creeks and, and streets. And, um, and that's a one-time opportunity to earn some money. But this provides uh, this, these apprenticeships that, that my colleagues have um, uh, incorporated as one of their recommendations actually offers an opportunity for a, a career, a technical career, um, an opportunity for people to stay in the city that they're living in. Um, I'm not gonna reiterate all of the um, benefits. I think my colleagues have done a really great job in, in terms of laying all of that out. Uh, I just wanted to provide my perspective. Um, I don't know how we um, can continue to build in San Jose when we know that there's been wage theft from some of our, um, some of the projects that, that are out there, that there's been uh, enslaved workers um, and that this is, and that this is an opportunity for us to um, build in some protections for um, for the folks who are doing the most difficult uh, work, um, which is labor, hard labor. So, so anyways, I, I I won't go on because I obviously am laying out the reasons why I will um, support this um, memo, and I thank my. My colleagues, uh, Councilmember Cohen and, and Councilmember Sparza, for submitting this to rules and making sure that we keep um, the well being and, and the future of our workforce, um, labor workforce, in the forefront. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, I see Councilmember Cohen's hand back up, but uh, Councilmember Cohen, I'm going to jump in uh, yes. at the moment here and we'll come back around. Um, so first off to kill any suspense, I'm gonna be uh, supporting moving this forward to the to the full council uh, and it shouldn't come as any surprise in regards to the ask that we have here uh, at the table. This is something that I was arguing for a couple of years ago, um, which would be just to broaden the umbrella of projects uh, that would fall under the project labor agreement. And, uh, and I appreciate my colleagues bringing this opportunity forward. Um, what, I'd like to, to clarify is I think how best we can move forward considering the early consideration form, um, uh, Matt, that, that you have um, presented and, um, and like to dive into that a little bit. But I think number one, uh, you mentioned that it, it sounds like it would be pretty easy work and uh, sorry if I'm, I'm changing the words, you can, you can correct me, to uh, make the adjustments on these four items, if these are the only four items that we actually 
moved forward um, to change that the actual adjustment of those, for instance, dropping the, the threshold from 3 million to 1 million is likely not a lot of, of, of actual uh, hours is, is my understanding. Um, can you clarify that, 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 you know, the actual work, if it was just these four to change is, is actually not that significant? Sure. I'll, I'll um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, I'll start off by saying a lot of times, even with these four changes, um, a lot of times we want to do some policy analysis um, to look at, to see if there are any pros and cons, if there's. Oh, any yes. Yes. And sorry, let me, let me, before you, but, but, you, you, yeah, just, just to, just to, um, let me be yeah, more specific yeah. in the question because yeah. I did actually read that in your yeah, early yeah. consideration form, uh, and I'm very well aware of that. Right where yeah. at times when we ask for a policy change, we'll ask for you know go out to do the community engagement and the involvement, do some policy mm -hmm. work. L mm -hmm. Let me be more specific in the question yeah. to say none of that would be included, and and so and I'm, and this is hypothetical at the moment, but let's yeah. say yeah. none of that is included. It is strictly just, you know, we accept the fact that we debated this years ago, we did the outreach and engagement, we have an understanding, we can dig back up that those documents. We simply now want to just come in and have a policy shift of, of, of some of the thresholds and, and the exemptions. So sans all that other work, would this be uh, significant as far as just those those four changes? Yeah. So so yeah. Under that scenario, where, where there's no policy analysis that staff pro provides, um, then just adjusting the agreement. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, Nora can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think yeah, this is. I'm just looking at on my other screen at the four items we're talking about: changing the dollar threshold. That's just going into the agreement and changing the three to a one, removing the CPI. That's probably crossing out whatever in the agreement says CPI. Removing the project exemptions, that's just kind of taking out that last page of the agreement and removing the references to it. And um, in the agreement right now, it does uh, it does specify any state, I, I forget the exact language, but any state approved apprenticeship program, not just joint slash union. And so this would be just changing that to joint. Um, and so just the contractual changes, um, yeah, would not that hypoth in the hypothetical scenario would be very, you know, very quick and, and simple to do. Um, yes, yes. And I understand it's hypothetical because, yeah. for instance, maybe we get direction at the full council to, to do some other things. So I, that's why I wanted to make it clear that that the line item changes themselves, um, hypothetically, right, um, would, would not be um, would not be super significant. Let me get clarification from Nora. That, would that be the case that, that um, you know, minus any other uh, outreach or engagement or analysis that the actual line item changes could be done fairly easily? Uh, yes, and I was just trying to see if any of that was in the ordinance itself, and if we had to change mm -hmm. the ordinance at all, um, there there might be something there. I just haven't had a chance. It won't pull up fast enough. Um, so it, if it's just the contractual, it would be a, uh, a matter of changing the form language. Um, most of those, I think, at this point are pretty much form agreements. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's going to you know, it doesn't take any time at all. Obviously, somebody has to go in there and rewrite the agreements, um, right? And we have to then approve them. So I, I get it. it. No matter what, it's going to take some time. I just wanted to to get a clarification on, um, you know, how significant of timing are we talking about? Because when I did read the early consideration form, um, Matt, you did point out in regards to the significant uh, work that we did in the negotiations that were done previously to get to our current PLA. Um, and, and I would agree, there was a lot of work that went into that, um, a lot of analysis. And, um, and, and I would say from my part, um, on where I was interested on where, you know, we wanted to go with with the project labor agreement, the analysis was a lot of direction in my mind on analysis or paralysis by analysis. Um, the, the idea or intent of, um, there's a difference of opinion on the council and could uh, a majority of the council then sort of delay progress on something by analyzing it to death? Uh, we've seen this time and time again. This is not something unheard of. We are in politics, so it shouldn't be surprising uh, that that is a tactic that may be used. And so um, I, I think that is a lot of, of why we, we had been delayed in the past. And I would say for me, uh, as what I'm reading in the, the, the memo, and I'll ask uh, Councilmember Cohen uh, or Esparza to clarify, but what I'm reading in the memo doesn't include any analysis, doesn't include for us to go back out and, um, you know, and, and have uh, a detailed uh, community engagement or negotiations on this. 
Um, I believe personally that we've already done all of that. Um, we landed on a slightly different set of agreements than, than where I was interested in a couple of years ago. And, and now there's uh, an interest in, in a direction to, to change that, to adjust that. Um, so I'll, I'll ask Council Member Cohen um, or Sparza if you want to jump in, just to clarify um, what exactly, I'm reading your memo, so that's how I read it, but what exactly is it you, you're asking for there? Yeah, I, I think your, your analysis is a fair one. I mean, that's, that's the intent. And just to be a little more specific than that, uh, and you know, the question was asked about whether this belongs on the roadmap versus belonging as a, as a simple council vote. Um, you know, to me, a roadmap would be we're trying to analyze a brand new policy. We're trying to decide whether we're doing something totally different, but we have a policy in place and what we're asking for here is a tweak to that policy that so that we have maybe so we have more contracts that are affected by that policy but we're not really asking for an overall discussion um, of whether or not this policy belongs okay councilman sparza did you want to add anything or is that yeah yeah that i that david or council member cohen uh captured that perfectly this is a tweak of an existing policy um and versus starting something brand new from scratch thank you okay thank you and, and look as somebody who was here during that discussion um from beginning to end uh, what got us to where we're at today um you know I, I would agree that that what we're looking at here is something that has been discussed in fact the threshold was something we debated heavily before and it, again the analysis in my mind was done on that uh, we just landed somewhere different and now um there's an interest in, in one that i share on potentially moving that. Um, now, the hypothetical here is that as this goes to the full council, um, if a majority of the full council says, well, wait, we'd like to, to do some further analysis. And so that's where the hypothetical comes in. Then yeah, I would understand Matt saying, hey, that's gonna take a significant amount of work. But the other hypothetical is that that doesn't happen and we get uh, a majority of the votes on the council that say, look, we agree this is just a, a change um, in the language. We don't want to go out and do it, um, you know, all of that uh, analysis again in, in, in engagement. We, we'd like to just simply change some of these parameters. Um, and, and in that sense, I'd like to, to get a response from staff. And so I want to ask you now to do it on the fly, Matt. But when this comes back to the council, um, having that in mind, the discussion we've just had now, I'd like to hear from you. Um, what you think it actually would take as far as timing uh, and staff to, to implement those changes. And, and, and Nora, obviously you, you as well, from the city attorney standpoint, um, where you think realistically, hey, look, we know it's not maybe a significant amount of work, but it is gonna take you know, some time. Um, and here's what we think that would take to actually implement those changes. Um, and I think in my mind, the worst case scenario, for instance, on this, this second issue of ongoing staffing to, to sort of monitor um, the, the program itself and oversee the program itself. Um, in my mind, worst case scenario is we change this program and, um, and, and potentially we don't have uh, exactly the amount of, of staffing we'd like to have to oversee it. Um, but I'll even dive into that a little bit with you for a second, Matt, here, just to see if I understand that correctly. Um, and, and, and even still, though, I, I would, I would you know, want to be able to change these thresholds and policy um, and, and, and then work towards during the next budget cycle, which would be shortly around the corner, uh, maybe after creating this, this change, um, to talk about some staffing uh, increases if indeed they are needed. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll ask about that for a second. The way you were describing, uh, Matt, on, on overseeing the projects that qualify for uh, PLA, um, for like project managers, for instance, on, on understanding what the PLA uh, would require and, and, and then being able to, to sort of closely manage um, and oversee these projects. Don't we do that anyways, whether it's a PLA project or not, right? Aren't our project managers, um, right, closely having to oversee these projects um, regardless, whether it's a PLA project or not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our project managers have a responsibility and they manage their, their construction projects where um, what I was referencing more is um, this is not something they learn in school. This is not a, um, in most engineering schools don't teach um, or maybe they do now. It's been a while since I've been in school. So um, and they should probably teach more the more social um, side of engineering. But um, a lot of them aren't used to this. Um, and this is something that um, where we don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to, uh, we want to make sure we're maximizing local workforce, we're maximizing the relationships with the building trades council working partnerships 
and our project managers are not going to um, know that outright. They're not going to always, and there's always changes. This is a um, this is a very complicated world, um, the PLA world. Um, it's it's very complicated, um, and um, at regarding um, and and so it's really important that our project managers are always and continually trained on the PLA, uh, making sure that we're tracking to make sure that the steps that they need to take, that they're taking, make sure that they are following up with the forms to the contractors and the contractors are giving those back to the tops and working partnerships um, to make sure that we are um, really, really maximizing the targeted, um, targeted hire program, which is really important part of the PLA is that it needs to be maximized better. Um, and so that's, what this person and this this staffing would do, um, um, it wouldn't take that responsibility off of the project managers. Um, and as an organization in San Jose, you know, there's a lot of different policies that we have and that we're adhering to, and and something that we have um, not invested enough in um, until more recently is really we it, it's it's incumbent upon me to provide the resources to my project managers so that they can adequately do their jobs and to train, make sure they have the training to adequately do their jobs. And that's what um, San Jose needs, I need to, public works need is, needs to do a better job at. And we have been working on that more lately. And this is something that is akin to that. Sorry to, um, no, I'll stop there. I don't know if I fully answered your question. No, no, yeah, um, I appreciate that. And, and uh, obviously, right, um, looking out for your staff that's doing the work um, and ensuring that they have all the you know support and training they need necessary um, is is what you know we all want to hear from you. So so uh, I think that's that that that, that answers it. Um, do you have staff right now that specializes in overseeing the PLA projects, considering what you just described on additional training and overseeing and stuff like that, or is that something right now that is shared across the board from all your project managers? It's it's there's no one focused on PLA right now. I mean, it's, it's kind of like an everybody thing. Um, you know, our procurement team has has put it, the PLAs into their process so that there's a trigger on anything that qualifies for a PLA to make sure the PLA gets into the agreement. Um, but we haven't had, um, we don't have a particular person um, um, that is was, was staffed for, you know, for, you know, you, you've been added to the budget and your focus is on PLAs, so. Are, so then are you training everybody now in regards to that i know we've only had the 12 projects but i'm assuming uh, you know being that there isn't one person um is everybody have a basic understanding have you had some training uh, well since we haven't had as many projects it hasn't been a comprehensive since it's fewer projects um, and fewer project managers it hasn't been a comprehensive department-wide training program which we would need to do if it was expanded um okay it's expanded okay and and i did i, I do remember that from when we debated it before, the number of projects that would be captured, uh, if we went down to a threshold of there was two million we were talking about, and one million that that significantly more projects would be included. So I would agree with you there that um, the twelve projects likely hasn't triggered uh, a need for some some comprehensive uh, you know wide training, but that uh, this change would would uh, would require that, and we would want people to be to be aware of that and be trained. Um, and and look, I would want to support you in getting the staff to do that. Um, but I don't want to delay the action and actually changing the policy. And here's where my belief is, is I'd, I'd prefer to have the, in my mind, what I feel is the right policy in place, um, even prior to, to then having, you know, maybe the, the perfect number of staffing uh, that we would need to do the, the continual uh, forward oversight and training of it. Um, and considering that we would be just a few months away, um, and my guess is when the language here could get updated, uh, but, and, and that time between where we are debating in the in the budget in in staffing needs, um, that there would be a, 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 an insignificant amount of time to where we could then have that discussion at the um, during the budget hearings, and and ultimately be able to to advocate for the additional staff that you may. Uh, that you may need to get you completely um, staffed up uh, and to get your staff uh, and your project managers completely trained on uh, on overseeing more PLA projects. Um, but I would rather have that right policy um, versus what we have today, which is not have this PLA agreement on a significant number of projects and and then end up with what we've seen, which is 
some unfortunate uh, projects where we do have uh, wage theft uh, publicly, right? Where we've been shamed in, 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 uh, in the, the media and to our community where they've seen um, some of the projects that where the city has contracted out and, and we have challenges and issues. And I think a lot of that, um, as we know, goes away when we have uh, this PLA agreement. And, um, and I think that, that for me, that is, it is the, the right direction to go. It's the right policy to go. Um, and I, can, I believe we can do both. We can make the change that sounds like it's, it's um, fairly low bar if we just have the line item change of these four. Um, and then be able to come back during the budget to actually allocate um, the, the, the necessary FTE, uh, if indeed it is the two, to, to go in and adequately train everybody, prep everybody, get everybody ready. Um, and I think we just need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, the realities of what you've stated. Hey, look, if we change this policy, your project managers are not going to be up to speed where they should be out the gate come February or March, right, or before the budget, uh, that they're not going to be there. And, and that we need to accept the fact that uh, that, that will be the reality and, um, and that, that we need to then prioritize during the budget process to get you the resources you need uh, and accept the fact that, um, right, that, that there may, it may not roll out perfectly. Our, our new PLA, uh, you know, agreements and projects may not roll out as perfectly as you'd like them to or we'd like them to. Uh, but I'd rather have that policy in place now um, than, than essentially uh, wait and gamble to see if, if um, you know, we can get approval in the budget for the, the staffing um, and then uh, delay it and potentially even end up with more projects where uh, we have some unfortunate circumstances um, that they're city projects, but yet there's still wage theft going on uh, or delays uh, or, or overruns um, and you name it. I think a lot of the challenges that we've seen on projects like this that, that are not covered through a PLA. Um, so uh, I appreciate my colleagues uh, hearing me out here. Um, I will support moving this forward to uh, the council and then I'll hand it back to Council Member Cohen. Yeah, just, just very quickly, um, I think that there's a longer conversation coming about how we have enough compliance staff in our, project, in our public works department. Um, and I think that's what we're talking about here, but I think that's a separate discussion from this. Um, and I look forward to maybe during the budget process, figuring out uh, how we beef that up. Um, I, the, the main point here is that there were too few projects captured under the current limits to provide the, all the job benefits that we know can come from having a PLA in place. And given that we're trying to, as Councilmember Sparza said, build back better, I think we, we need to be able to offer more people the benefit. Um, and I'll just, Go back to one other thing that Matt Kano mentioned. This this overall um, uh, policy expires in 2024. We're not proposing a change in that expiration date. That's the point at which the council will revisit: Is it working? Is it not working? Does it need to be? Are other parts of it that need to be changed? And I think it was really important that we don't mess around with the term, the, the timeline terms of the contract. But we're edit, we're editing existing contractual agreement to make make it apply to to more of our workforce here in San Jose. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Dennis. Uh, thank you, Chair. That was from before. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes our uh, conversation here. If we can do a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? No. Prowlers. Yes. Thank you. All right. Motion passes three to one. Um, and that'll now move us down to. Hi, this is Tony. We have a public records appeal that we'd like to defer and reschedule. Oh, the okay. next. Day. Um, can I ask why? Uh, the appellant is not here, and I haven't been able to confirm with her today that she's coming. And I want to assume that there was a technology technology error that she somehow didn't receive it, rather than assume she didn't show up because she didn't want to show up. Okay, and just to be clear, if she didn't show up, then would we would we still take the vote on this? Um, if if we didn't defer it, you guys could hear it and you could vote on it. Um, 
but she wouldn't be able to speak to it. And I, I would prefer to give her the benefit of the doubt that, that like we made a mistake on our end versus her making a mistake on her end um, and give her another chance to come. Yeah, no, I actually agree with that. I just, uh, I wasn't certain. And I think it's important to, to, to clarify that because uh, I do think that is the right decision and giving her the benefit of the doubt. Um, but recognizing what we, you know, sort of what could have been done and, uh, yeah. but I can support that. So um, if we can take a motion then to defer this. Motion to defer. Second. second. Motion is second. Uh, we will go to speakers of the, or members of the public. First up is Paul Soto. And just uh, for info again, obviously we're on item, uh, I won, this is the public records appeal from Catherine uh, Wheeland, which we've just decided um, because she's not here to defer. Uh, yes, Paul Sopo from the Horseshoe. Um, Tony coming into the record at that moment and saying, just saying what she said on the record before, the, the, before knowing anything, that in itself right there was illegal that was illegal because this is this is this is a legal issue this has everything to do with the police department and a body worn camera okay this is evidence so this is this is taken to that that right there is wrong okay I, you're not going to tell me oh well it's a perception it's an opinion it's a, a why well, don't know i got to check the log no no that on its face is wrong and you can't keep doing that in front of people and think that people are not going to call you on and tell you how inhumane things like that are. This is where these are where the crimes against humanity happen. It's not some guy yelling on some street corner and somebody afraid that they're going to attack him. It happens right here in the language. Do you know how subtle and how when I was on the yard, the the the, mo the most the most violent gang members in this state. I'm there living with them. And there's a certain energy to give up and certain way that they talk. And that's what's happening here is that you talk, but you're having like two or three conversations at the same time. But because you know you're on the record, there's a re very refined way in which you learn how to communicate. I know because that's how they communicate in there. And so th this is this is some this is the piece that I'm telling you that I, I see it, I hear it, I feel it, I see the moves, and it's just wrong. And what what has to happen? You, you, you mean you don't have the capacity to look at yourself and see what you're doing to the people and what it's going to the effect it's going to have on the people over the next ten years? But that was wrong with. Me. Okay, thank you. Next up will be Blair Bigman. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks for the words of Paul. Um, I took this item to mean, uh, from the words of Tony, that uh, she wanted to give the person, uh, the uh, 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 person who's asking about the situation, the benefit of the doubt and a way to reschedule this for another time, which I thought was uh, very uh, decent uh, of, of Tony to do at this time. I, if, if that is the case, just thank you immensely. <laughs> because uh, I find this issue for myself and all the years of, of accountability with the future of technology that I do, I find this an incredibly important uh, case example for ourselves within San Jose, how to talk about the issues of body cam footage, the privacy issues involved. And I would very much would like to hear public discussion about why this, this woman is being denied uh, the chance to see uh, video footage uh, of her life story and uh, or why her lawyers are not <laughs> allowed that either. And uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I have concerns about this issues a lot. And I, I hope, you know, you made some steps in San Jose. There can be more steps to work on this issue. And um, boy, I mean, it, this body camera things, uh, it should be a con an idea of accessibility. And I, I just hoping that, uh, uh, the, the, the person can return and, and can be willing to want to uh, have a public process for this so we can all have a, an important learning experience 
Good luck uh, on this issue, and, I, and a thank you, I think, to Tony for um, offering the benefit of the doubt and uh, of themselves, of, of yourselves, and offering to uh, possibly uh, put this off to another time. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our public comment. And I will uh, add, uh, Blair, you have it understood uh, exactly correct. Um, uh, I know it was an, an abrupt request by Tony as we started the item. Um, but this actually is to the benefit of the doubt of uh, the appellant here, Catherine Weiland. Uh, otherwise, we as a committee could have simply heard the item, uh, her not being present, she would not have been able to speak on it, and then we could have voted on it and she would have lost that opportunity. Um, so it may have been abrupt, but it actually is to the complete benefit of the doubt of the appellant here. Um, and hopefully everybody uh, understands that. Um, okay, we'll now uh, take a roll call vote on the uh, motion to defer. Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go on to open forum. First up is Paul Soto. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, the reason why that's wrong is that this is a democracy and considering the, the, uh, the uh, reimagining and the, the tone that we're trying to take as a city to start pulling uh, authority away from the police department, that this city could exercise that is what I'm saying. You're saying that because I could do it legally, well, then I could do it and then the Yastua, that's it, you lost out. This is a citizen in our community that has a contention that is trying to extract information about her life and her interactions with the police officer. And you're going to talk about it like a lawyer. You have to decide, uh, Perales. You really oh, have Paul, to decide. This is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll remind you, Paul, this is open forum. So you're, you're yeah, uh, well, this limited to speak to items that are about. not on the agenda for today. OK, you, no, you're right. You're right. OK, that's right. You got it. my bad. My bad. Secondly, the, I'm going to talk about just the moral issues. Mo how, legislating morality, do we have a responsibility to do that? Or do we need that codified too? You know, do we need to send that to staff? Maybe an AI data analytics will tell me how to legislate morality, how to be moral or ethical or even just decent and human within the context of city government and the way that we legislate the laws by which we hold others to, to account for. There is, it, it's too cavalier, man. It's too, you're not really understanding what it, what it's like on that end. I do, I've lived it all my life, man, all my life. And so this is why I can see it. I can see it, I can spot it. Just like when a woman, when a woman gets abused, her, her, her ability to sense danger and things, they tell them, hey, pay attention to that. Well, I got mine, but I got mine in a different place, but it's the same principle. And I know when danger is near, and it's right here in this council. Next up will be Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman. Thanks for the meeting today. Uh, it, was, it was helpful and important. If I maybe can understand what Paul was trying to say, you know, maybe the woman is uncomfortable to tr to want to appear the appellant. Um, if that's the case, you know, I, I don't think uh, you, you, there's pressure for her to appear, and I don't want to put that pressure on her. But, uh, you know, really from my end, uh, it can really help uh, set an example of what exactly we're working with and dealing with in San Jose. Blair, I'll, Blair, I'll have to give you the open. same the same admonishment, just to make sure that this is open for him. So it's got to be on items. Not okay. On okay. So in my final remaining time, I, I will I will continue from here. Um, yeah, uh, in my final final remaining time, I would like to consider um, the ideas of uh, what is uh, the city charter commission is they're going through a series of uh, different uh, yeah, re draft recommendations that could be possible for the future of the city charter. The uh, ideas around uh, uh, a technical advisory board, technology advisory board were, were mentioned. Um, there was no mention of the possibilities of, of, of open public policy ideas, good civil rights and good civil protection ideas and practices that are really important to the future of technology. It isn't just the inventiveness of technology anymore. It's the, you know, the civil rights and civil protections that come with 
the inventiveness of technology, that really has to learn, it's a full package, and that has to be learned to be spoken of uh, accordingly uh, and together. And it takes practice, I think we can learn it, it's important we learn that. I meant no ill will to the, to the woman earlier, good luck in how we can work on this issues, uh, thanks. All right, our last public speaker will be uh, Gail, Gail Osmond. Hi, good afternoon. Well, I'm back here. I want to talk about the debacle of the porta potties over at phase three. Council member Raul, this is your district. This is a disaster. I beg you, please, let's move them. You can split them up in three ways. They're easy where they can go get clean, united. There's two porta potties over at Heading. You can move some there. There's another site. Um, I just don't understand why nobody seems to care about these people and, and they can't even use the porta potties at nighttime because there's 20 in one area. This is, this is a mess. And I've offered my services. I can show them where to put them and nobody has reached out. Maybe their eagles are too high. They don't wanna have to reach out to me, that's fine. These porta potties need to be moved. Everybody, we need it. it. They can't be there anymore. They need to be moved where people can use them. We can split them up. Also, there's two families out there. Councilwoman Arenas, there's a family where a little baby is younger than your daughter and they're living like dogs with the rest of the people living in phase three. And Home First has been out there. They just say, hi, how you doing? There's two families. We need to get them inside. This is horrible. They don't deserve to live outside or even in an RV and not have a, a, a stable environment. And you have people getting millions of dollars and what are they doing, just walking around? I'd like somebody to look into Home First and maybe ask them, how many have they got inside? Maybe permanent supportive, some of the um, RV no, the places on Evans Lane. There are two beautiful families that need to be inside, not living at phase three with the rest of the folks. Okay, thank you. That uh, now concludes our, I mean, I said, Councilman Morenas, your hand up. I think that might've been from before. Um, no, uh, Chair, I just wanted oh, to okay, um, okay. Um, see if, if maybe Gail could, um, I know this was in your district, but if um, she's asking for support, um, and I know that uh, Jackie has been working with a lot of um, housing for families. And so I'm more than happy to connect, but I'm sure that your office is more than well equipped to do the same. Yeah, no, thank you. We'll take any help. Um, <laughs> so uh, feel, feel free. Um, okay, uh, that will conclude our uh, meeting for the day. Thank you very much. We're adjourned.